Okay. It's recording now. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so shall I let everyone in? Yeah. Okay. All right then. Right. Welcome, welcome everyone. Yes. Welcoming everyone as they're coming in. Yeah, Yay. a few more participants. Welcome, welcome. Hi. Right, okay. So is that everyone, Laura? There's I can see oh no, there's still people coming I in. I don't hear anything yet. So as you're coming in, uh, you may want to mute your microphones for now, since uh, we will have the Q&A session after the presentation. Hi, Vicky. Hi, B. Hi, Katie. <laughs> uh, I can see you, B. Okay, for the stage. Yeah. yeah, is that all, everyone, Laura? You can see. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, welcome, everyone. Um, this is the third talk that uh, we're hosting like this um, and we're very happy today to welcome uh, Lauren Ackerman who is a research associate at the University of Newcastle. Uh, Lauren is a psycholinguist and cognitive scientist with expertise in syntax a bit of phonetics uh, but she uh, is right now mostly interested in uh, the issue of gendered co-reference um, from the uh, interpretation perspective, so from the cognitive perspective of um, the, um, uh, let's say, the interpreter who looks uh, at uh, a person's, interprets a person's gender and then uses that information, I guess, to uh, make syntactic uh, associations, interpretations, and, and reference assignment. Uh, so that, that's, that's, if I'm understanding it correctly, so that's that's the area that we will hear about today. A bit more, uh, I guess, a, a bit more technical or a bit more psycholinguistic um, in those terms uh, than uh, the talk we heard from uh, Kirby uh, a, a month ago, actually. Uh, but hopefully, we can continue the, the discussion in. Uh, the same kind of vein. So we had started a very interesting discussion then, which we will hopefully uh, continue now uh, on the topic uh, of gender pronouns. Um, so uh, just housekeeping a couple of things. Uh, this talk will be recorded or is already being recorded. Um, again, hopefully that's, uh, that's okay with everyone. Uh, if you don't want, I don't know if you don't want your thumbnail appearing on the screen, you can uh, switch your camera off. Um, after the talk, there will be the Q&A. Uh, so uh, we run two types of question and answer in the Q&A because there's people who want to speak up and then there's people who prefer to write in the group chat. Uh, so we will be running both of them and we'll try to alternate uh, between the two, although sometimes the group chat gets uh, <laughs> takes a life of its own, so I'll try as much uh, as possible to alternate, but it's probably um, the more obvious way to ask a question is to raise your hand. Uh, how do you raise your hand? So uh, for those who haven't used it uh, before, uh, you go um, at the bottom of your screen, here you see participants, so if you click on that you will be able to see all participants. Uh, and at the bottom of the list of participants, you have the options raise hand, yes, no. Yes and no is if, if the speaker wants to, to have a quick poll, uh, for example. Um, and then we, we will take it from there. Okay, so I'll explain that. Uh, I mean, I'll, we can go back to that after Lauren stuff. Uh, but yeah, so the, that's it for me. So uh, yeah, welcome, Lauren. Thank you. Um... Let's see, how do I share my screen? There we go. At the bottom of your screen again, yes. Screen? Yeah. I'm gonna mute myself. <laughs> Sorry, while I click around. Oh, has failed to start. Well, there's our technical issues. That's always something, isn't it? 
There we go. How's that? Excellent. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Um, I am uh, going to, I guess, it's been a little while since I gave this talk, so there's a couple changes. I'm, I'm gonna try to get through it. It's not very well rehearsed, but I'm sure that we can, um, we'll make it through together. So I'm gonna be speaking about uh, the influence of gender nonconformity on pronoun comprehension. And so, um, Uh, through uh, some project, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how I am conceptualizing gender and what gender means when we, like, what the word gender means. Um, I'll show you some behavioral data, some of which is brand new. I've just finished the analyses actually today, today, um, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up a little bit uh, and talk about future directions where this can go because there's so much out there that still needs to be done. This is hardly a, an answered question. So um, of celebrities and cowgirls is my example. When we see a sentence like Taylor saw herself, we get an idea of who herself or Taylor might be. Um, in this case, we might think of someone like Taylor Swift. If we see a sentence like Taylor saw himself see or hear, uh, we might think of someone like Taylor Lautner who is a cis man. And then if we see some, a sentence like Taylor saw themselves or Taylor saw themself, we actually might end up thinking about someone who's non-binary and uses a non-binary singular they pronoun like uh, the character Taylor in Taylor Mason in the show Billions uh, played by non-binary actor Asia Kate Dillon. And so in this way, we can see that Taylor might be underspecified for gender because it can be referred to with female, male, and gender neutral or underspecified gender anaphors, herself, himself, and themself. However, we get to this issue around names when we find sentences like Jeffrey saw himself. Now, Jeffrey is a archetypically masculine name but not everyone who's named gender, uh, Jeffrey is archetypically masculine. So here, Jeffrey Marsh is depicted and they are a non-binary advocate and activist and their pronouns are they and them, but they have a name that would suggest to you that they're masculine, which is not true. So then we can say that the way these words connect is not entirely based on superficial traits of the words. So um, going to another example, slightly more abstract, we can have a sentence like at the ranch, the cowgirl left her lasso in the kitchen. And here I've actually drawn an arrow to show that her and girl are connected and that they quote, match in gender. Now we can also have a mismatching sentence and I'm putting big air quotes around that. At the ranch, the cowgirl left his lasso in the kitchen. People might be a little bit tripped up by this sort of sentence um, because cowgirl is definitionally female and his is the masculine pronoun and those two things are different so they don't match. So how can they co-refer? But we only need to change a really small component of the context of the sentence, not even the structure. And suddenly it's a little bit different. So at the Halloween party, the cowgirl left his lasso in the kitchen. The cowgirl left his lasso in the kitchen has remained the same, but by putting it in the context of the Halloween party, suddenly these two things make more sense to co-refer. The cowgirl is actually uh, someone who uses he, him pronouns. So we can say maybe a man. Uh, but is being described by the word cowgirl. So is it that the gender of the pronoun needs to match the gender of the word it co-refers with, cowgirl? Or is it that the pronoun matches some different, more abstract gender category out there, either the gender of the person that we are referring to or the gender that they're presenting as or, or something else? How do we figure out how the, how the pronoun and its referent connect. So in English, we actually get a really cool paradigm to work with. So it's not just a language of convenience in this case. 
um, we really only seem to have consistent and strong gender on pronouns. Now there's a couple of nouns, mother, father, which are, are fairly strong. Um, female and male are pretty much definitionally female and male. But beyond that, because of uh, this sort of Halloween costume imposter uh, condition, you can have layers to that gender, which make it difficult to, to is on the lexical item or word or the actual referent in the real world or something else altogether. Now, other languages have other strategies for dealing with this. Languages with uh, grammatical gender or noun classes have a um, linguistic feature that needs to match or sometimes needs to match. And if you've got questions about that at the end, I, I'm happy to talk about um, some other languages. So then we might want to find out how much variation there is within a language and between languages and between people who speak the same language, how much you're able to vary what kinds of reference you can refer to with different pronouns, whether they're um, masculine pronouns, feminine pronouns, or gender neutral pronouns. So maybe also we can think about the word matching, which I've been putting in quotes. I, when I talk about matching, um, if you're familiar with co-reference, you might think of binding conditions, or you might think of um, feature retrieval. And in these cases, there's something stored in the mind that labels a word or a phrase uh, as having a feature. And the feature of that word or phrase would need to then match the feature of the pronoun in order for those two su to successfully link up. But we see this variation in English and in other languages. And so maybe it's not actually the syntactic matching that's what's being checked. Maybe it's something else. And so it could be that not only this varies um, across languages, but maybe it varies across individuals, whether uh, an individual is more or less flexible with what sorts of categories can match or mismatch in order to determine who a pronoun refers to. So I want to take a step back from the linguistics and talk about gender. Gender um, is one of those terms that we use in linguistics, but in a lot of other fields as well. And so I want to define it um, in a more specific way so that we all are on the same page and we know what I'm talking about when I say gender. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is what I call a conceptual gender or biosocial gender. Now, I, those are actually different things, but they all stem from a similar source. So let's start there. Um, gender changes over the lifespan. You're born with a certain set of, of predilections or, or parameter settings for your gender. But depending on your life experiences, what society you grow up in, what sorts of gender roles and stereotypes are available, the shape of your gender landscape changes. And this can shift around your preset parameters to fit one category or another category. And so this is the social development of gender. But then also there's this cognition of gender where we view other people based on our experiences of gender and we as humans love categorizing things. So depending on what our individual gender landscapes look like, we will categorize the people we see and interact with based on that. Um, so there's the gender that you see yourself as, uh, which I call biosocial gender. And then there's a the gender you see other people as, and that I call conceptual gender or cognitive gender, or uh, conceptual gender. Let's go with that one. Um, I've talked about it using different terms over the, the years, and I want to just stick with that one. Um, and they're based on the same things because we all develop gender throughout our lives. It's, it's something that every human culture has but not every human or every human culture has the same shape of that space. Okay, so what are we actually perceiving and categorizing? So this is where biosocial gender comes in. 
your, your gender as you experience it is determined by a combination of factors, including your phenotype, um, which includes secondary hormonal effects, uh, your body shape and type, the way you express your gender. So this is choices you make about your clothing and your hairstyle and accessories, uh, among many other things, the way you talk. Uh, then there's also gender role. So these in, uh, are like your preferences, the way you interact with others, in what social expectations are, your, uh, are placed on you, but also what social expectations you hold for yourself. Um, so this is sort of who you are. What is your gender? coming from your experience. It's not, however, your sex organs, because typically we don't see those and it's rude to ask about them. It's not typically the karyotype, which is your uh, chromosomes or your genes, because even though they are broadly consistent with your um, phenotype, uh, your phenotype is, is strongly influenced by your karyotype. Few people have actually had the medical tests in order to figure out whether they have two X chromosomes or an X and a Y chromosome or some other combination. And the fact that there's more than two combinations right there should tell you that your karyotype by itself is not enough to determine your gender. So that's something else altogether. Um, then finally, it's not your gender identity. So your biosocial gender influences your gender identity, but it's not the only thing, it's not the same thing. So if you were here for Kirby's talk, you might recognize this image. Uh, it's just a, a great um, example for how we can start thinking about the way we categorize people. Um, so these are nerds candy, uh, very popular in the States. I don't know whether you can get them here, but um, you, you should, we should, they're delicious. And great for this, um, this uh, analogy. So we've got these two colors, pink and purple, and we've poured them out of the box. They come in these two little halves of the box. And so when you pour them out, they're in two little piles next to each other. And they're broadly separated into categories with pink on one side and purple on the other. But down the middle, it's not clear cut. Like you can probably categorize them if you individually moved them over to one side or the other, but then you'd be changing their location. You'd be changing something about them. But there's also a couple in there. There's this um, white one way on the left, and there's this really dark pink one in the middle. And then there's this regular pink one, but that's completely surrounded by purple ones. And these are in some way um, anomalous. They either have slightly different characteristics that make it difficult to categorize them. Oh, and look, there's even this tiny little hiding pink one in there. <clears throat> they, so they're, they're either difficult to categorize or in their, they're in a location where it's not easy to push them into one category where you think that they belong. Um, and so this is what we can imagine people to be like. We're just some uh, conglomeration of features that occur somewhere in space and time and culture. And we broadly fall into two categories, but not everyone. And even those who are pretty far on one side or the other aren't necessarily going to fit all of the stereotypes or archetypes of those categories. So this is my more abstract version of this. This is my biosocial gender space. It's a two-lobed distribution uh, that takes place in an abstract space. Um, and it also has color. It's multidimensional. Unfortunately, we only have computer screens. So um, that's, we only get the two dimensions plus color. But if you can imagine uh, men being on one side and women being on the other side. Uh, most people are going to fall broadly into one of those categories, although there's plenty of variation within both, and then some people will fall somewhere in the middle. So um, that's biosocial gender. Now we've got conceptual gender, which is how we see other people. Now in Western society, in most Western societies, uh, and we, we, we typically have two predominant genders. And so we take all these people who occur on this large gradient, uh, multidimensional, 
gradient and we lump them into two categories. Um, but it's not always clear who falls into which category, even though we have labels for these categories. So um, if we label one category with feminine words, um, especially if you speak a language with grammatical gender, and one category with masculine words, uh, we can sort of say that there's this third level too, which is that grammatical level. So we've got women who we referred to as she, we've got men who we refer to as he, um, and these influence the, the number of, of categories that we split people into, but also the very uh, bimodal shape of the distribution then influences the number of categories that we perceive, therefore what we can label. Now, I've been kind of trying to get to this point right here where we have this space between our two categories. And this is that nebulous space where we aren't sure whether the candies are pink or purple or whether they're on the left side or the right side, or maybe they are clearly pink or purple, but they seem to be on the wrong side in big air quotes. This is our gradient middle space. And it doesn't mean it's neither masculine or feminine. Uh, we only get two dimensions, so that's kind of what it looks like. What it does mean is it's not clearly in either group. So going back to English, um, if we're thinking about this construction of, of three levels, when we have sentences like Taylor saw herself, then herself can very, very clearly refer to Taylor if Taylor's a woman. If Taylor's a man, then Taylor saw himself. Himself can very clearly co-refer to Taylor. And with themself or themselves, ta um, Taylor and the anaphor can co-refer if Taylor's gender is unknown or non-binary or possibly not relevant. There's, there's a lot more flexibility here. So what is actually possible with this co-reference. Um, what can we observe people doing? How, how do they react to these sentences? How do they produce these sentences? Which I won't be getting to. Um, but then also, what is the cognitive process behind learning to use words like themselves or themselves for individuals rather than for groups? Um, how can we learn to do that and, and what, what's the process for doing that? And so these are a lot of the questions that um, the exploratory research in this area is doing. And so when I first started this project, um, there was very little research published on singular they of any sort. Uh, the, the two papers that I had found before I started this project were um, about gender neutral, singular they, and then gender unspecified, singular they. And both of them um, pretty much, I'm not sure whether they weren't aware of non-binary genders, but they didn't address it at all. And so it seems to me that there is a gap here because we might, know something about underspecified singular they, even though there's only these two papers, but what about specified singular they when that person is non-binary? And so as I was developing this project, it, it started to happen. Um, lots of other papers started to come out on singular they. It was a very popular topic, and I guess it still is. Uh, so gender expectancy, this is starting to look at how um, our expectations about the person we're talking about. That is our cognitive, our conceptual gender of them, how that influences our processing of their pronouns. And then just this morning, I looked up on Google Scholar, singular they and non-binary gender. And there were 500 examples in just the past four years of publications and presentations on this. And as you can see from this screen cap, they're actually mostly about grammar uh, in the linguistic sense. And we even have some psycholinguistic ones. Um, Grisha Prasad's work on the P600 and Evan Bradley's work on um, 
gender judgments of of non-binary pronouns and, and non-standard pronouns. And then um, Lex Con Canelli's recent work on the actual morphosyntax and social learning stages of learning paper. I, I must recommend all of these. And if you're interested, I can send you a more um, complete bibliography because there's a lot of great work out there. So anyway, this started off as very exploratory. That's all to say that this is the beginning of my exploration before any of this had gotten published. I first just wanted to see what is matching? What matches and how do people respond to things that you might guess are mismatched? So to do that, I wanted to create um, a complete comparison of feminine, masculine, and what I at the time called shared names. And then the anaphore types, herself, himself, and themself. And I wanted to just see what sorts of reactions I could elicit from people. Um, so I chose themself here as well because it's got distinctly singular morphology, so it's less ambiguous. Um, and so here are some of the results. I asked people to rate sentences uh, of the sort, name saw blank self. So Chloe saw herself for the feminine um, names, uh, Jacob saw himself for the masculine names, and Taylor saw themself for um, the shared names. And as you can see, if we look at the himself ratings, that's along the x-axis, the green dots, those are the masculine names, are very highly rated. If we look at the herself axis, that's the y-axis, they're actually still pretty high up there. So they're all pretty much clustered between sort of four and six and a half, six. So what that says to me is that people don't really hate mismatched gender. It's just not as good. Because we see the same thing as well with the feminine names where they're all very much at the top of the, the graph where herself and feminine would match so that they're all at ceiling there. But then none of them are particularly low. They're all between 2.5 and 6. So again, it's more of a range. But um, in general, people don't hate mismatching the name with the pronoun. Then with the shared names, uh, it looks like they're matching in both directions because they're between five and a half and six on both axes. So that means that people thought that there wasn't really a mismatch condition for these equibiased or shared names um, when we look at herself and himself. But there's another thing going on here. And so actually, if we, if we look at this spread, um, these are all average values by name. I also wanted to look at the average values by participant. So maybe certain participants were more likely to rate everything very high. Or maybe some participants were rating some mismatches very low and they were just getting swamped out by, by values in the middle. So I am now gonna show you a graph that compares the um, matched names. So Chloe saw herself and Jacob saw himself with the mismatched names, Jacob saw herself and Chloe saw himself. And here on the left are the matched ratings by participant and on the right are the mismatched ratings by participant. Unsurprisingly, matching ratings are all very high. Strangely enough though, the mismatch ratings span the entire scale. Some people rated mismatched sentences consistently at the bottom of the scale, but some people rated them consistently at the top of the scale, and it's a fairly even distribution from the top to the bottom. So what's going on with that? Let's take a step further. I, I looked at the demographics I collected on these people who rated the mismatched sentences at all levels, and there is a correlation where younger people tended to rate mismatched sentences higher, closer to seven, than older people. Now there's also a skew in ages with more younger people participating and um, my self-reported male participants being almost entirely in that young demographic, whereas my self-reported female participants span the whole range. But this is actually broadly consistent with things that 
um, Kirby has shown as well, where there does seem to be a, an active change in progress where younger demographics are adopting singular they and um, are, are being more flexible with the way they refer to gender. So even though this graph looks only at the mismatch between um, binary pronouns and names and biased names, um, that could be reflective of the same sort of change in progress. So on to my second experiment. Uh, I mentioned before that I chose the word themselves because it's uh, more morphologically marked as singular, whereas themselves has the plural marking selves. So even though we can use it for a singular person, there's a little bit more ambiguity there. So I wanted to see how much that actually made a difference. Um, and to do this, I did a simple two by two design and I elicited acceptability ratings for sentences of these forms um, where I contrasted the antecedent types were either indefinite pronouns like someone or anybody and the um, names were either highly biased feminine names like Chloe or highly biased masculine names like Jacob. And what I found is fairly consistent between um, all of these categories. Themselves is more standard. It's certainly uh, the word that we use for plural groups. Um, and so that's rated um, somewhat higher than themselves. However, especially when it's paired with the indefinite pronoun. When we look at the names, however, not only are the, um, the two anaphors, themselves and themselves, not only do they have almost the exact same distributions, they're also in the middle of the scale. So people don't hate. And um, this, I did a sanity check and I looked at the fillers that were designed to be both much better than these target sentences and much worse than these target sentences. And there were definitely people who rated um, some sentences at the very bottom of the scale consistently. So it's not that people didn't use the whole scale. It really is that these name plus themselves and name plus themselves sentences are just sort of middling for these people, for, for my participants. So it does seem to differ by antecedent type how we consciously think about themselves and themselves. And there is a little bit of a difference between themselves and themselves with our indefinite pronoun antecedents. So someone saw themselves versus Chloe saw themselves. Um, but when it comes to names, there's not much of a difference at all. And this is interesting because it suggests that people are adopting singular they, even for biased sounding names. Uh, and really what it comes down to is we just don't hear themselves as often as we hear themselves. And this can be confirmed again. Uh, I collected um, substantial demographic information from these participants and of the ones who reported experience with gender nonconformity, that means either themselves, a friend or family member, um, or someone that they work with is gender non-conforming, um, transgender, non-binary. Um, of these people, there were significant correlations between how much exposure or experience they had with gender non-conformity and how highly they rated the indefinite or the, the antecedent plus um, the singular they anaphor in, well, at least in three of the conditions. So someone saw themselves, Chloe saw themselves, and Chloe saw themselves all displayed this strong correlation, well, not strong, but a significant correlation. However, in someone saw themselves, we see a trend in that direction, but the um, correlation did not come out as significant. And on the one hand, this might just be because it's a very small number of participants and, and you have to take this with a grain of salt. But on the other hand, Someone saw themselves is the most common set of words in that string of any of these four. So it could be that we are so used to hearing themselves that if you've picked up singular they at all, that's your default form. 
or that's just the more familiar form. So we wouldn't be as likely to see a correlation with experience with gender nonconformity because we all have experience with that sort of singular they. It's neither the um, morphologically marked one nor the one with the bias name. So that's all well and good. That's um, offline conscious rating studies. The next thing I wanted to look at was what we actually do in real time. So uh, what do we do before we know what we're really processing? To do this, I came up with a two by two design and recruited participants from the general population. So we have this sentence where we start with our antecedent, um, then because it's a fairly long sentence, I had to insert a line break. So we have something like, antecedent might have been able to see themselves clearly in the still water of a pond. And I asked people to read this sentence. Now, I didn't actually have them reading the word antecedent or a series of hash marks. Um, I split this into four categories. The antecedent's gender could either be biased or unbiased, and the antecedent's specificity could either be generic or specific. Now, that's not a great way to name this, but let's go with it. Uh, the generic antecedents were either something like a pilot or a hairdresser for the biased condition or someone or anybody from the unbiased condition. Now, there's some structural and semantic differences there, which we will talk about in a little bit. Um, but in terms of specificity, they're both indefinite. Now, in the second category, the specific category, they're both names. We have our um, biased names like Chloe or Jacob, and then we have our unbiased names like Taylor or Jordan. Then, um, so these four categories are the only manipulation that occurs in this sentence. So the antecedent is one of these four categories, and the critical region themselves is consistent across all four versions of this sentence. And that'll be critical for understanding what happens. Now, before we go on to the results that are really interesting, this first half of the experiments, experiment 3A, only had people from the general population. I did not recruit specifically based on any sort of um, experience with gender nonconformity or uh, individual's gender. And most of those participants had fairly minimal exposure, but not zero. It was a, a non-zero amount of experience. Um, so this is, a, a, I would say, a fairly representative group of the Newcastle area, a range of ages and a range of genders. And so what we can see from this is just a, a very brief look at um, how people progressed over the course of the experiment. So in general, uh, there's not a difference at all in the pre-critical region, the one that precedes themselves, the post-critical region, it slightly gets faster, or even in the critical region themselves. But if you look at the antecedent, over the course of the experiment, people ended up reading generic antecedents faster and faster. So that's the, um, a pilot, a hairdresser, or someone. Um, now, they ended up reading them faster, not necessarily at the beginning when they're first reading it, but when they go back to reread it as they're reading through the sentence. So what this means is, or what this could mean, I should say, is that as people go through the sentence, they're getting more and more used to associating the generic antecedent with themselves. So... Um, a pilot might have been able to see themselves clearly in the still water of the pond becomes easier as the experiment progresses. We don't see that for the specific condition. So Chloe might have been able to see themselves clearly, et cetera, is not actually speeding up. We're not, uh, we're, our participants are not getting more used to it as they go. Now, I also did this exact same experiment on uh, having recruited from a specific population. I put out a call for participants 
who were non-binary or transgender or who were socially close to someone who is non-binary or transgender. For instance, people with family members, close friends, um, close coworkers who, uh, or who were themselves um, non, yeah, non-binary or transgender, um, in order to get people who would have put conscious thought and effort into learning about pronouns, as pronouns are kind of an inescapable part of being non-binary and transgender. And so I wanted to see whether these people's behavior, and now crucially this is real-time pre-conscious behavior, whether that is sort of broadly the same as the general population or whether it differed. So I'm going to um, step through this in a couple of different uh, locations. First, let's focus on the antecedent. So this is the, um, the pilot or Chloe or someone or Taylor. The first moment that people looked at that word, the first time their eyes rested on that word, there is a, a, a main effect of gender, of referent, and an interaction between the gender and the referent, which means that when people looked at a name, it didn't really matter whether it was a biased name or an unbiased name. They spent about the same time reading it, no matter what the condition was. And you can see that from the, the two dots being very close together and the error bars largely overlapping. However, in the generic condition, the first time you see a generic antecedent, either biased or uh, um, biased, you read it very fast. So this is a pilot or a hairdresser and unbiased, you read it somewhat slower. But both of these generic reference are still read faster than the specific reference. Now, the reason I'm going through this, it's it, if you know anything about psycholinguistics, this may not actually be that interesting or novel. Basically, what it's saying is that the, um, the gender information that comes with the biased antecedents is allowing for faster processing than what you have to process when you have an unbiased antecedent like someone. Even though it's not attached to an individual person, that actually causes this almost paradoxical effect where you have to then imagine a person. You've got to do the extra mental work of coming up with who someone is. Um, whereas when you have a name, now it's not only um, having to come up with who that person is, but then maybe identifying exactly who that name refers to in your mind, so that's even more work. So this is how we get sort of unbiased um, someone and biased Chloe, both being read faster, or excuse me, both being read slower than something like a pilot or a hairdresser. Anyway, the moral of this graph on the left is simply that names are treated pretty much the same across populations and across conditions, whereas the um, generic antecedents are treated slightly differently. Now, in the graph on the right, um, we see a really interesting interaction. There weren't actually any main effects that came out as, as significant, but there are two high-level interactions being displayed here. The first one is, as before, there's an interaction between gender and referent, where generic referents are now being um, reread. So as you come back to the antecedent from later on in the sentence, they're being reread faster than um, or generic unbiased antecedents are being reread faster than generic biased antecedents. And I think this makes a lot of sense. I think it's pretty um, clear why this might be the case. Something like someone is semantically light, as I said before. And so it's more easy to then connect that to your anaphor later in the sentence. Whereas um, a biased one you have all of the semantic information that you have to recall in order to determine whether or not it can be linked with the anaphor. Now, if we look at the specific antecedents, we see the reverse pattern where the biased antecedents, oh, did I mess that up? Did I totally? No, no, I got it right this time. This one always confuses me. Um, the biased antecedents are read faster than the unbiased antecedents in the specific condition which is odd considering that we don't see any difference between biased and unbiased antecedents in 
first fixation um, times. So what this could be is that once we get to the word themselves, which is consistent across all these conditions, we actually are seeing a, an easier um, connection between a, a, a biased name and themselves, which is kind of the opposite of what you'd expect. So this is saying that Chloe might have been able to see themselves clearly is read faster, or Chloe is read reread for a shorter time than Taylor might have been able to see themselves clearly. So what this could be is either um, the name like Taylor is is causing some sort of processing conflict where you have to then uh, go back and re-specify what the gender of Taylor is. You've got to then give it some sort of non-binary gender or choose between a masculine and feminine gender after you get that information that your um, interlocutor is not telling you the gender or is telling you an, an uncommon gender for your antecedent. The other possibility is that the um, frequency of the name, which unfortunately is entirely correlated with the gender biasness of the name, is influencing its retrieval. So in this case, that would mean that high frequency names tend to be more gender biased. Chloe and Jacob are very high frequency names. Maybe that's why they're being read for shorter periods of time than um, names like Taylor or, or Jordan, which are somewhat low frequency, somewhat comparatively low frequency. However, if that's the case, that doesn't explain why we have an interaction between the general population and our narrow population. In the general population, we see that not only are um, biased generics, like a pilot read faster than in the narrow population, but also that biased names are read slower than in the narrow population. And that could just be because the narrow population, uh, in, some people do change their names when they transition, but not everyone. And um, non-binary people have a very interesting um, set of options because in, in terms of what we as a society understand about what non-binary is, uh, just like Jeffrey Marsh, you can have a gender biased name and use singular they pronouns. So some people keep their names or choose binary sounding names even when their gender is not binary. So it could be then that this narrow community is adapting to that and, um, are, and we're seeing the, the name frequency effect without any interference from singular they being somehow marked or unusual. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, right, gotta wrap this up. So on the themself region, here's where stuff gets, in my opinion, really interesting and a little bit more confusing. Um, the go past time, which is the time it takes you to read to the right of themselves. So antecedent might have, have, might have been able to see themselves. Do you look back? That's a time that's included in the go past reading time. Or do you move on to clearly? Then you would stop recording the go past reading time. What we see here is only a main effect of referent. So at the word themselves, people spend more time reading themselves if the antecedent was a name than if it were generic. And there is a trend for the unbiased antecedents to lead to faster reading times on themselves than the biased antecedents. Now, that's not super interesting by itself, but then if you add in the right bounded time, which is very similar to go past, but it's only looking at the region themselves. It doesn't include anything before themselves. So how long does it take you to cross that right edge of the word themselves when you're looking within that region? Not only do we see that main effect of referent again, but we have an interaction between the two communities. On the left, the general community, community has a very, very strong um, uh, effect of referent with generic antecedents leading to faster reading times than specific antecedents on singular they. The narrow community, however, is a lot more fuzzy. Um, 
they actually appear to be going in the opposite direction for biased antecedents with names leading to faster reading times on uh, themselves. But not only that, the, the unbiased um, antecedents, so someone and Taylor, are being read really a lot faster in the specific condition than in than the general population is reading. And this suggests to me that the narrow population, the population familiar with gender nonconformity and pronouns, has somehow gotten used to singular they and is therefore able to process it faster. So not only is this something that we can see in offline decision-making things, but it's something that affects our real-time processing, something that affects some, um, the way we're actually retrieving and understanding words at the, various early, uh, the very earliest levels of um, processing. So finally, taking a step a little bit back, when we look at total time, we're including those earlier reading times, but also all the time that someone returns to that region. And so it's sometimes considered a, a, a later reading time or a, a slightly anti-conservative reading time. And here is where it becomes most clear what's going on across these two communities. On the left, the general community treats biased and unbiased um, antecedents generally the same um, when they refer to different sorts of reference. So we've got um, generic reference being read faster than specific reference, whereas this narrow community sees an entire reverse in that trend where biased antecedents and unbiased antecedents end up being read much faster in the end. Um, although it seems that unbiased antecedents have a similar pattern to the, in the generic in the general community. So again, what this might mean is that the narrow community is used to having people with high frequency gender bias names being referred to with singular they, and this influences their actual reading times, not just their conscious decision making. So uh, uh, I've been talking about names a little bit, and this is still something that I'm confused about. I'm not quite sure how it plays a role in all this, but um, the frequency of names varies a lot. And this is a graph of American uh, names of people born between 96 and 2000, which at the time of my uh, earliest experiments were undergraduate ages. Um, uh, th this does vary. Uh, this is slightly different to the uh, British distribution of names, but you'd be surprised how much overlap there is. That it's mostly just switching from masculine bias to feminine bias for different spellings. But um, this could mean, because all of these names are so much lower frequency, like Justice and Ashton and Casey, uh, you may only know one person named Casey. And in that case, that person's gender might be that definitional gender for the name for you as an individual. And so in order to figure out the way our individual variation influences the way we um, gender names, one, we'd need to do a much more in-depth association test to individually determine what stimuli to use for each person that we bring in, which is a huge undertaking and I invite people to join me on it. Um, but this is also constantly changing and it's very difficult to keep up with. So I'm not sure how this fits in. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, basically, my, the moral of this slide is there's some stuff that could be happening. Um, but what, it, what, what I can say about all this is that singular they does seem to have at least two distinct subtypes. The generic singular they that refers to a generic antecedent, someone left their coat in the classroom, behaves differently to the specific singular they antecedent for Taylor left their coat in the classroom. This we can see in conscious decision-making behaviors and the ratings, but we can also see it in the uh, unconscious reading time behaviors. Now, it affects reading times differently for different groups of people, and it's not entirely clear why that might be, um, especially when we see the reverse in trends. But it's possible that this is because specific um, biased antecedents are um, 
somehow providing more information in a way that allows people to do less cognitive effort to retrieve them. So they don't have to make up who Taylor is because Taylor could be Taylor Swift, Taylor Lautner, Taylor Mason. And so rather than having to put in that um, extra effort to define who Taylor is, um, something like Chloe comes with extra uh, definitions. It's prepackaged, if you will. So that's one possibility. And we also have to deal with this name frequency effect or um, how people are actively adapting to non-binary singular they given different amounts of exposure and different relationships they have with the non-binary community, either uh, it being themselves or a close family member or a coworker. Then finally, one thing I just want to add to all this is that learning a new pronoun, especially a, a novel pronoun. So we've been talking about singular they, but there are other pronouns that people use. This is hard. Um, this is hard for everyone. If you've ever learned a, a language that has a very different pronoun um, repertoire than your um, native language or languages, then you'll know that remembering how to use pronouns is, is different to learning to how to use nouns. It's, pronouns are much more like functional words than lexical words in some ways. Um, so it's possible that more experience with non-binary genders increases the bottom-up evidence for these new pronouns. It could also be that experience with non-standard pronouns or non-binary pronouns increases the top-down evidence that allows you to see the categories that you can then label with these new words. And this would be backed up, I think, by a lot of L2 work on how we end up learning new sets of features and languages with very different paradigms to our own. But then the question is, if this, if this is in one of our languages, so not learning a whole new language, but within, say, English, is this evidence enough to actually acquire a new pronoun category? What does it take to learn a new pronoun natively, or at least fluently enough, that it becomes a, a stable tripartite paradigm with he, she, and they. And now I would love to thank all of you for listening uh, and coming to this international talk. This is really exciting. And again, if you want a more comprehensive list of references uh, to cite more transgender and non-binary researchers who are working in this area, let me know. You can email me or tweet at me, and I'd be happy to provide that. Okay, I'm, I'm jumping in to say thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, there is an applause reaction if you want to add your applause. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, that, that's that's really uh, fascinating work um, and, and, and lots of findings to discuss. Uh, so yeah, we, we'll give the participants some time to, to formulate their thoughts and think about their questions. Uh, in the meantime, let me just remind to anyone who doesn't know our center, our research center, with the Research Center for Language and Linguistics at the University of Kent. And you can follow us on Twitter at KentTLL, yeah, which I'm going to put in the chat. Uh, yeah, okay. Is there a way that I can see the chat? Should I stop sharing my screen? Uh, yeah, it's fine. I think, if you, uh, I think it's still fine if you're sharing your screen in case people okay. have questions about uh, the slides, uh, yes. and there are options at the top where you can see uh, swap the screen or, or select the view that you prefer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chat you can see by clicking on uh, yeah on, on chat at the bottom of your screen. Uh, same for participants. So you can see participants, and you can see chat by clicking. On Does this show up on on my shared screen when you when I have a chat window? Uh, no, not covering anything. Okay. No, it's not covering anything for us. Because Fabulous. We do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's wait for some hands. Um, reminding you can raise your hand through raise hand. You should be able to see the option. Ah, there's a, a question in the chat from Marlo. My was my research funded? Um, it was funded by an internal grant from Newcastle. Uh, this was part of my postdoc project, and then I also received funding through the Center for Behavior and Evolution at Newcastle, which is through a Welcome Trust grant, um, but that was mostly to use equipment. It wasn't specific to my project. Okay. 
uh, I think you have options in the chat as well. Uh, if you want anything uh, to be discussed by everyone, you can just uh, click everyone. Okay. I'm, I'm, I think I have to scroll through all of the participants in order to see if anyone's hand is raised. Uh, yeah, I think usually what happens is people's raised hands appear at the top. Okay. That was my experience from previous time. So I can't see any hands right now. Um, oh, there's one. Okay. So it's uh, Daniel. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Yeah, this, was, this was a really great talk. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you have any speculation about what these kinds of results might mean for people who want to get better at using non-binary pronouns appropriately. Yes. Uh, does this tell us anything about um, potential strategies for learning how to use these pronouns or anything like that? Yes, I think it does. I don't think that it um, it's provides any new information, but it does very much support the strategy that people have been advocating for a while, which is just practice. Um, I know that at, at the They conference in 2019, one of the things that was discussed in, in length was if you are able to um, gather a group of people and refer to uh, a friend or colleague who is not present in the singular they um, and practice that for an entire day and keep each other accountable, that that sort of practice ends up being very effective in. Um, at least in an anecdotal way. And, and that is supported by this because all of the people who seem to be having um, faster reading times for mm, biased names when paired with themselves, all of these people were the ones who had um, reported, who, who were recruited for being either non-binary or transgender themselves or because they had close relatives or friends who were non-binary or transgender. Therefore, they uh, used singular they much more often. They had cause to, they were corrected uh, by their colleagues or friends or family, and they had given it a lot of conscious thought. But then in this unconscious task, they ended up showing that they were reading it faster and, and therefore, by extension, processing it faster. Cool, thanks. Yeah, Christina. Yeah, um, that was um, super cool. I'm going to do like a, an annoying thing and not ask you about anything you have empirical. Oh, uh, that's fine. That's to say about. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, right. So let's take the the case of reflexes. Okay. Yeah. So this is like, like the nerdy language processing question. For Lauren, love it. Um, is that is that cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. excited. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay. So, so let's take reflexes, right? They're licensed by Ben Follet, Binding Theory, which is basically C command, right? Mm -hmm. um, if everything matches, no problem. Um, but if there's some degree of mismatch, right? So there's one way for two two elements to be perfect match, but lots of ways for them to be incongruent, right? Um, so, I don't know if you were there or you remember this, but um, Roger Levy, um, like a CUNY years ago, um, and probably a subsequent paper, uh, so if we take his proposal seriously and let our parser decisions take into account uncertainty about the input, about the, the preceding context, sentential context, um, then when we get a mismatched reflexive antecedent pair, do we then entertain the possibility that we're wrong about the C command relation? Because, wait, here's why I asked this. Okay, um, because Rogers parser only handles uncertainty about word identity, right? So maybe you heard that instead of van or something. But if we're talking about like non clause bound relations like C command, then there's, that's like a lot of uncertainty we're managing if we pile that like all on top of uncertainty about words about phrase boundaries locations of pitch accents and all the other stuff right yeah um, yeah so like 
parsing a non-ambiguous, totally garden variety sentence is like way, way, way more complicated than we previously thought. But there's nothing about like a, your standard, like off the shelf parallel parser that does that uh, does not allow that. Right. Fabulous question, and I'm so in okay. this context. Yeah. But I've thought about it a whole lot in the context of um, structural ambiguity. Mm -hmm. uh, so if uh, this is actually what my dissertation was on. Yeah, I know. Okay, okay. Well, now everyone else knows too. So <laughs> um, I would guess that, so going back to your original question, does um, the ambiguity from the... Um, Themself, the singular they reflexive trigger people to potentially try to reconstruct earlier parts of the sentence to then create a different sort of structure that would allow um, maybe non cataphoric uh, 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 co reference constructions. And I think mm -hmm. that that's very plausible. Um, I don't know the extent to which that would be entertained because um, in my dissertation, I found that people do seem to create these limited regions of parallel parsing. But um, as you said, it's what, the more ambiguity you entertain, the more complex uh, the retrieval is, the more you have to hold in memory and it becomes really untenable really fast. So. I would be surprised if that were um, a consistent behavior or if that happened in the majority of the cases, but if it happens occasionally, um, that would make a lot of sense, especially for people who were less familiar with um, singular uh, non-binary they, uh, people who, who weren't used to having that co-refer with either biased names or um, really any sort of specific antecedent. Yeah. Now, the, the other thing about, uh, what, what was it? It was, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the second half, but I had something to say to that too. Um, I think the second half was, um, like, do we really consider the possibility that we have, like, um, so if you have uncertainty about word identity, then that can then um, feed into uncertainty about, say, uh, syntactic category identity, which then obviously can lead to possible word uh, uncertainty about structure, structural decisions. So then, yeah. like, do we actually, do we actually, like, consider all of those things when we're parsing yeah, any I mean, old that's, sentence. I think that's still a, a mostly open question. Um, I'm not... Yeah, I, I agree. I, it's a totally open question. <laughs> I'm just totally asking you to speculate. Um, I, here I am revealing my biases. I'm not a huge fan of that sort of noisy channel um, mm -hmm. processing thing because, because of how much... Uh, processing resources it must then logically take up if you have to then whittle everything down at every stage or then keep things open for so long. Um, that said, a, a more limited form of that where um, let's say you get to themselves and you keep reading <clears throat> and a few words down the road you you realize well wait a second was it themselves or themselves because if it was themselves maybe i misread the antecedent wrong and it was actually the pol um the the pilots and not the pilot or a pilot um or maybe it said tailor like the profession not the tailor like the name um I can imagine that sort of confusion or, or uh, disambiguation happening, as I said before, occasionally. But I think it's one of those things that would be on such a case-by-case -case basis. Like I, I um, even though I, I've, I have evidence that the parallel processing, the limited parallel processing 
um, disambiguation stuff that happens doesn't seem to happen on a trial by trial basis, but seems to happen within a trial and within a participant. I, if you've ever done any eye tracking research where you watch someone's eye moving across the screen as they're reading, I think that there's something that needs to happen where we do a, a much more qualitative almost, um, or, or case study, uh, analysis of the way people are reading these sentences because I would I would be surprised if people didn't vary on sentences on on different sentences like that sometimes you're reading a sentence and you just do have that ambiguity where sometimes it the ambiguity doesn't even cross your mind even within the same experiment even within a few sentences of each other just because of the way mental noise interferes and the way your mind can drift while you're reading. But then again, that, that's my little bugbear. I think that qualitative eye tracking while reading studies need to happen. I just don't know how. And pass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, anyway, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Thank cool. you. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Laura has a question in the chat. Yes. So do I or quicker associating name. That's an effect of the recent Canelli paper with stage two and stage three speakers. Ah, that's a really good point. Um, I hadn't made that connection, but that makes a lot of sense. Um, let me think about that for just a moment. Okay, so in the Canelli paper, which everyone should read because it's brilliant, um, Stage one is when you, uh, if I believe, I believe this is correct, and Lex, if you're there, I'm sorry if I get this wrong. Um, stage one is where you don't have a singular they. Stage two is when you have a singular they that can refer to generic or underspecified antecedents, and stage three is when you have a singular they that can refer to specific antecedents or, or um, individuals, uh, and the transition from two to three is harder than from one to three because in stage two, you have um, certain gender features set or the absence of gender features set in a way that's harder to change than if you have to start from scratch. So um, if people are learning or are showing if the general population who we might assume is in stage two is showing an increased reading, no, 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 a decreased reading time over the course of the experiment. So they're reading faster over the course of the experiment. The unbiased antecedents when paired with singular they, that would suggest that they are getting more adept at associating the generic with the singular they, but they're not doing that with names. Yes, that would be consistent with stage two. Now, I don't think I've actually looked at how the narrow population, the narrow community, um, the non-binary familiar community has, I, don't, I haven't looked at their order effects yet. So it might be that they have the same order effects, in which case I'm not sure that that would be supportive of, of the different stages or not. Uh, but if we saw that they sped up equally for names and for um, uh, the generic antecedents over the course of the experiment, that would say that they're treating them the same or that the way they connects to those antecedents is the same for both types. It's also possible that we wouldn't see a change over the course of the experiment because they've already sort of hit ceiling at, in terms of their processing for these. And so it's not weird. And so we wouldn't expect them to need to learn anything. So um, it's a good question. Uh, and hopefully I'll have an answer for that when I finally get around to looking at that part of my data. <laughs> Great. Uh, we have Lexi in the participants list. Uh, yeah, so let's see. Hiya. Hiya. Uh, thank you for the uh, talk, really interesting. Uh, this is a general question about gender studies. Um, so I'm interested in how neurotype can influence gender. 
So just anecdotally, in discussions I've had with my other autistic friends, uh, we think being autistic has affected uh, our trans or non-binary identity uh, because being autistic affects how we process social roles, expectations and even sense of self. I just wondered whether you had any um, any insight into any studies about how neurotype affects gender or whether um, it affects not only how you perceive your own gender but how you interpret others? Absolutely. Um, I am very pleased to hear that your your group, your friends have um, the same observation that that I have made with my autistic friends. Uh, and that is that it does seem that autism and certain aspects of, of um, gender broadly construed do seem to correlate. Now, this is pure speculation on my point, but my personal theory, um, personal hypothesis, personal speculation is that the, um, the elements of cognition in, in autism that are, are, are typical of the autistic neurotype. So um, it's often described as focusing on details and not the larger picture, allows individuals to see the um, sort of minutia, the differences between the way they experience gender to the way gender is portrayed as being experienced by other people. And therefore that mismatch allows them to identify um, differences between their experience and what they perceive to be other people's experiences, which then allows them to separate uh, themselves into a new category and and when they encounter other people who have that category already, whether autistic or not, um, it's more easy to adopt a new category because of the detailed representation of, of gender. And I think this goes for sexuality as well. I've noticed uh, uh, anecdotally a higher correlation between some of the more esoteric sexualities in autism. So, so asexuality, um, pan, demi, uh, several other types, uh, people with um, non-holistic people, so autistic people or non-neurotypical, neuroatypical people do tend to, to um, identify with those categories at what appears to be a higher rate. And that's my, that's my reasoning is that whatever um, cognitive differences there are allow you to identify those variations, which allow you to create these new categories to identify with. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm when you, I'm, yeah, I've got yeah, to say this is like pure yeah, speculation. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wonder um, whether that's something that people will look into uh, sort of academically. Yeah, actually. Um, so I, um, I've been part of a, an on again, off again project that is sort of looking at this <laughs> sort of with an, um, so basically, we're we're looking at the way small variations in phenotype influence um, uh, gender stereotypical phonetic perceptions, which is just way out there, and I, I still feel very complicated about this project. But um, it's under review. Um, hopefully it'll be published at some point. The long and the short of it is there have been some observations that are very noisy and must be taken with a grain of salt that the 2D, the length of your index finger from crease to tip, and the 4D length of your ring finger from crease to tip, the ratio of the length of those two correlates with the um, hormonal milieu that you uh, were exposed to in utero. So antenatally, perinatally. Um, now, generally speaking, people who are exposed to a, a very ex extreme ends of what's normal tend to have typical um, feminine and masculine uh, phenotypical traits. Uh, people who are exposed to uh, somewhere something in the middle, all, I mean, they're still generating their own hormone milieu, um, but 
for instance, um, oh, I don't remember what it stands for, but CAH is an androgen and sensitivity syndrome, I believe, which um, leads to the phenotype and the karyotype sometimes mismatching. Anyway, this is all to say, it seems like the hormonal milieu that you are exposed to in utero influences your cognitive development in small but detectable ways that have no clinical significance, but might actually then affect you the way that you categorize yourself and therefore the people around you and therefore learning from them as in-group or out-group may be slightly different. So, I mean, this is all strange and out there stuff, but um, it's, yeah. it's a hypothesis to be tested. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, really interesting conversation. So we'll go to Emily from the participants and then back to the chat for uh, Mark and Dominique. Hi, um, I Hello. hope you can hear me. Yes. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So I'm going to ask you to speculate wildly again. Yay. Um, but I'm curious about what do we know about people whose L1 or primary language um, does not differentiate gender in the pronouns or the grammar. So like I'm thinking of Indonesian off the top of my head, where the third person pronoun is dia, regardless of who you are. Um, I mean, there are certainly cultural gender roles for sure, but it's not in the language in the same way. Um, what do we know about how they learn a language like English as an L2? So you were talking about English speakers acquiring a third grammar or a third gender category in the pronouns. Do we have any lessons from how people with one pronoun generalized to two and how might we apply that to English speakers, for example? So this is an excellent question and this is actually one of the things I, I'm hoping to explore very soon. Uh, there is some research coming out uh, or sort of un underway from other groups that look at the way L2 learners of English navigate singular they. Um, I, I don't remember what languages <clears throat> they are coming from. I don't know their, their source languages. But um, in any case, in terms of people learning English f coming from languages without a gender distinction, the, I mean, so, so we've got Indonesian, uh, Mandarin's an interesting case because there's no gender distinction when speaking, but there is when writing, um, Finnish, Turkish, uh, and a number of others, a lot of um, North American indigenous languages as well. What seems to happen is that obviously all of these cultures have minimally a, a man category and a woman category. And then Indonesia is particularly interesting uh, because there are many cultures, or at least several cultures there that have more than two categories, uh, up to five, I think. Um, so it, it's not that the conceptual genders necessarily differ, but somehow the mapping then of the gendered words, the linguistic gender onto the conceptual gender becomes difficult. So anecdotally, um, L2 speakers from Mandarin and Turkish can really struggle to remember whether to say he or she. Now, it's not like they don't know whether the person is a, a man or a woman or takes he pronouns or she pronouns, but um, it's something in having to do with the functional quality of pronouns that makes it difficult to then retrieve the appropriate features for that word when using it. Um, there's a 2008 paper, uh, I think it's Lardier, uh, feature reassembly, L2 feature reassembly, something like that, that has some interesting ideas about the way um, speakers have to reconfigure their functional categories when learning another language. And so while I don't personally know very much more about that, uh, there's definitely work out there that's looking at, at very similar things. And actually, I think, um, I'm not sure whether it's finished or not yet, but at least a couple of years ago, there was a, a thesis in progress at Edinburgh that was looking at the way um, Mandarin L1 speakers read in Mandarin and English, I believe, 
concerning gendered pronouns. Um, so if you're interested, I, I could look that up. I, I don't I don't remember who was doing it, but if anyone knows, student at Edinburgh, it, the, the work was being done at some point. Cool, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Now, respect to the chat, yeah? Yeah. Where, who are we at? So there's Mark uh, with another first linguistic question. So the research on first person pronoun use by transgender and non-binary speakers of languages like Thai, where the first person pronouns are gender marked. Oh. I do not know. Oh, I hope so. I want to know all about that. Thai yeah. pronouns are fabulous. Um, I, they, Thai pronouns are also really, really interesting because, and I don't know a whole lot about them, but um, especially when it, ref, when it comes to reflexive pronouns in Thai, uh, they are even less like function words than in English. So. Um, there's this ability to say um, the equivalent, I, I, I believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you can say something like, I saw Lauren's self in the mirror, where I'm actually using my name as part of the reflexive. Um, so did, has someone corrected me? No, okay, it's a different comment. So um, the, the Thai pronoun paradigm in general is, just fascinating, and I, I, I can't tell you more about it, unfortunately. <laughs> um, okay. Dominique, can I ask? Yes. Did I see any differences between the different groups in the narrow population? Were there differences between folks who ID'd as trans, gender non-conforming, non-binary, versus people who had a close family friend? I have not looked at that yet. Um, I will say that although I was able to recruit I believe 20, yes, 20 participants in that group, which considering how narrow a population it is and, and the issues, the ethical issues around um, recruiting such a population, I, I'm proud of having 20. Unfortunately, that's such a small number, I would be very reticent to make individual um, or subgroup claims about that. <sighs> On top of that, um, actually going back to what Letsy was asking, uh, there does seem to be a at least anecdotal correlation between uh, neuroatypicality and gender nonconformity. And so um, one additional thing we have to be careful with is that uh, of, the, of my participants, um, the only ones who uh, reported any sorts of reading difficulty, like dyslexia, or um, uh, dyspraxia, or I'm trying to think what other sorts of things might have come up. But the, yeah, the only ones who, who reported such things that might affect their uh, reading behaviors were also gender nonconforming. So that sort of confound would make it very difficult to tease apart any, um, anything, any subgroups in, in that category. But um, that would be really cool to look at. And if we could somehow get those participants uh, in sufficient numbers, I would speculate that there would not be a distinct difference, but rather a gradient difference that correlates directly with how much time they'd spent thinking about mulling over and, and learning about pronouns. Now, that could end up looking like two different groups because if your ID is the one with the pronoun change associated with it, you're going to spend a heck of a lot more time than someone who doesn't have to think about their gender every waking moment. Um, but that said, mm, I'm not sure I would actually attribute it to uh, discrete groups if, if we were to see any differences there. So. Yeah, great. Uh, back to Christina. Yeah. Okay, so just to um, ask you a, a question that's more related to your actual talk. Um, the, right, so this is about um, language change. So the kind of received wisdom about grammatical change is that it basically 
does whatever the hell it wants, right? So we can't stop it or control it, but also we can't force it to happen faster. Um, but, you know, it does diachronically relate to frequency and distributions of forms. Um, and with gender, this, that kind of relates interestingly to societal norms, which relates to intent and reasoning about things and doing things on purpose, right? Yeah. Um, paren CF, uh, um, old curmudgeonly person, Jeff Pullum's, um, they debacle on language log, if you remember that. Oh, yes. Like, eh, it's not grammatical for me. Right, right, right. So, um, is this whole thing a case of doing intentionally something that you think is appropriate or that you want to be, that you want to be grammatical? And that then, at a population level, changing usage distributions, and that then, um, affecting grammaticalization. I think that's Is that a very, the right way to think about it. I think that's a very plausible mechanism. Yeah. And, um, and we can draw a parallel between, again, this is somewhat anecdotal, but, um, there is wide anecdotal reporting that when a new speech feature or even meme comes up, people will adopt it, uh, ironically, or they'll make mm -hmm. fun of it. And the moment they start using it, ironically, it's over for them. It's part of their repertoire now. Uh, you can't escape hella. It's it's in it's in your vocabulary. You can't ex escape like. Um, a bunch of other things have come up that way. Like the moment you you start saying it ironically, it's it's in. And so um, I I think that. There's a, a combination of intention, and I think that because of the uh, the social and even physiological effects that misgendering someone has on the person you're misgendering, uh, that there is a lot of intent for well-meaning people um, when they're learning to use uh, a non-standard pronoun or a different set of pronouns for a person. Um, whether or not they're doing it very well is, is another story, but I think that there's definitely intent in there, but I don't think that it's entirely a conscious process either. It's not just do it consciously until you have enough tokens of it to adopt it as something familiar. Um, and I think part of that is because we already have singular they as a generic pronoun that's, you know, widely cited as being around since Chaucer. Uh, so then it's almost like just expanding that category. But this, this goes back to, to Lex Canelli's paper about um, the different uh, ways singular they can, can be adopted by uh, an individual, whether it's um, as a generic only or as a generic and non-binary or underspecified pronoun in the way people might be able to change between those categories. Um, yeah, so I, I've, I've gone on a, on a little bit of a tangent there. So going back to your question, um, I think that it, it is a very plausible way to think about it as, as sort of um, being driven by a combination of intention and societal change and that increasing the frequency which increases its familiarity which increases the people who are the number of people who feel comfortable adopting it which increases mm -hmm. the amount that you're using it and it's this sort of feedback loop and actually I would I would go out on a limb and say that we're in a very interesting place right now with English because we are not quite in an equilibrium but there are some pockets of communities out there that seem to have stably three pronoun or three gender categories, three pronoun categories with non-standard pronouns forming sort of um, unstable pockets in that gender space. But th that won't last. I think that um, if I had to guess, if I had to really just speculate, I would guess that we will have three pronoun categories for a short period of time 
and then it will collapse into a single pronoun category and we will, and English will become a, a non-gender pronoun language. Now, I don't think that's going to happen within our lifetimes necessarily, but... Um, but you said it here. It's I've a said it here. I've said it yeah. here. I don't think that, we're, that English is going to stay stably at, at three categories. And, and my reasoning for that is, is because, first of all, um, the more people you talk to who are adopting singular they and using it fluently, the more you start theying everyone. So even cisgender people whose gender is relevant, you just start using they for everyone. It's easy to do. Um, it becomes very common. The other day, I theyed a bird on, in my garden, which is very uncommon because it's not even something that would often take a, an animate pronoun, let alone a, <laughs> a marked pronoun like they. Um, and then the other reasoning for this is that I have not heard, despite really, really, really looking, of a single language that has three gender categories in its pronouns. There are languages that have three gender categories in the culture. There's, uh, so um, when I was speaking with Emily, uh, I was referring to the language Bugis, um, which is in Indonesia. They have five categories of gender. They've got five words. And at one point I thought I had found a manuscript or, or um, a grammar somewhere that had said that they had different inflections for each of the five categories, but either that was me popping into a parallel universe for a moment because I haven't been able to find it again, or I just made it up, I dreamed it. But um, even languages that do have multiple different categories within the pronouns, it's never split along gender lines. It's either masculine and feminine, or animate and animate, or noun classes, which can have masculine and feminine together, but you never get more than that for humans. And I mean, maybe, maybe English will prove me wrong. Maybe we'll stably have three, but um, that's, that's my forecast for the next eh, 500 years. <laughs> cool, thanks. That's great. <laughs> thanks. Uh, we have one more question that just popped up. Uh, a raised hand, I mean, from Helen. Okay. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hi, Lauren, I don't know if you remember me. I was at the Day Conference back uh, last summer, back when the mm. world and I really appreciate all of your research. I'm so impressed with all of that. And I, to be quite honest, that's not anything close to what I do. I just do speculation and speculation alone. <laughs> but my big speculation is exactly what you just said, that uh, the they is just going to take over. Uh, I'm a linguist and I know they is of, you know, the pronouns are, uh, you know, belong to that function word category that we don't think about and uh, just un subconsciously we're just gonna be using they. I, I really appreciated your comment about calling a bird a they uh, because that's the other part about this, uh, you know, the pronouns we're using for animals now. And also I just wanted to raise one more thing with that, that, um, you know, when you think about it, corporations, uh, you know, let's see, Google is changing their logo. I don't think we're using and it for things that are generally inanimate, although we might think about corporations as composites of people. But uh, they, I just, uh, you know, just want to uh, say they is going to be it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing you bring up about corporations, there's um, actually a very interesting difference between the general trends in American English and British English over when they versus it is used. Um, so. A lot of times, oh, and, and maybe Laura, you can help me out with this. I don't remember which way it goes. My brain is so addled going back and forth. But um, things like sport teams. Um, so I would say the Red Sox are, um, the Yankees are, the uh, Newcastle United is, but I but that's because it's a single name. So it's, it's not like Yankees sounds plural, but the Yankees is a team. So it depends on whether you're referring to it as the, the group or as a collection of individuals within the group. 
Um, so Newcastle are going to win. Sounds so wrong to my ears. Mm. Newcastle is going to win sounds right. And well, so therefore, if I'm using Newcastle as a singular entity, yeah. in, in referring to the sport team, um, then I might say, yeah, oh no, but I would say they're playing tomorrow. Yeah. Oh. Just like, you know, we say Google is, we would never say yeah. Google are. Uh, ah, I, would, would, would British speakers say Google are? Yes. I think well. they might. Yeah. Definitely. That's interesting. <laughs> so anyway, I think this is a, a, a related phenomenon, but um, there's a whole set of singular plural mass, not mass count, but um, uh, individual um, conglomeration. Oh, Emily, how dare you? <laughs> Emily's just written Boston is never going to win the World <laughs> Series. And I was in Boston both times. Anyway. That was a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, I think, that, story. <laughs> um, I think that, that that's a, a related property and, and it might then boost the use of singular they if we are referring to uh, corporations that are sort of individual entities with R. But I think that has more to do with the fact that they're made up of individuals. Yeah, thank, thank you again. And I have been following you. I'm gonna send you an email about getting that bibliography. <laughs> oh, please do. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Hey, great. So I think I don't see any other questions. So I think we can wrap up. Thanks again, Lauren. That, that's oh, that's really fascinating stuff. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation and, and the questions were fabulous. Thank you. Excellent. All right. So Laura, yeah, I guess we can stop recording and leave meeting. Yeah, goodbye everyone. Bye.